Hi everyone, this is Dr. Kusuma from Surya Cosmetic Surgery. I wanted to uh, go over something very, uh, I think, relevant and uh, uh, somewhat popular uh, these days. It's, it's every day this topic comes up and I'm trying to identify topics of uh, relevant interest uh, uh, with various aesthetic treatments. This one specifically is about lasers and radiofrequency microneedling. Again, you know, this is not a scientific lecture for you know scientific purposes this is more of a day-to-day -day, everyday you know practical questions and considerations to give a broad general high level perspective on why you would choose one versus the other in in a, in a broad term okay so let's just take this see this center uh, you know kind of um, uh, conditions that i wrote up pigment that exists in the skin you have crepey skin maybe under the eyes maybe around the mouth the vertical lines, etc. There's a lot of sun damage. For, for example, in darker skin, you may have melasma. In lighter skin, you may have all kinds of spots and irregular pigmentation. Precancerous sites like precancerous lesions from Florida sun that you can easily identify. And also ethnic skin. So people come with various conditions. And one of the things that can happen in aesthetic practices is that if you purchase a device of whatever type, you try to maximize the utilization of it. Uh, for everything because that's what you have and you want to treat everything. So for example, if somebody has a radio frequency microneedling device, that's what they want to use for everything and everybody. Uh, but that's not giving the patient the choice and not applying the technology for the right conditions. Okay. So let's briefly talk about at a very high level, you know, what are the major differences in technology of the two? So if you look at this side here, Lasers are various types, right? You guys can know, and you cannot lump them all together because they do different things. There's a CO2 laser, there's erbium laser, there's something called ND YAG laser, there's IPL kind of, you know, treatment. So there's various kinds, and they're all good for different things. And generally, if you were to imagine this is the articulating arm or the arm of the laser machine that actually goes towards the patient, these green arrows or green lines essentially represent laser beams. And so there's various beams that go down from the end. And if this is the skin here, it's treating the skin. So what is ablative and non-ablative, just in a high level? Ablative essentially means if you look here, I have created columns here, right? You could see individual lines here like this. So this is called fractionated. Okay. When the beam is fractioned into various columns and you're sparing this skin basically right here, this skin right here, in, in between the beams, there's no treatment there per se. So essentially, instead of using a broad column of laser, you are breaking the laser up into several individual beams with technology and you're leaving good healthy skin or untreated skin between the beams. The idea is you're decreasing the surface area that you're treating. Now you're leaving healthy skin all around the beam so that the healing is much faster. It's a lot less aggressive, a lot less downtime. And if you do it over two or three, four sessions, you essentially cover the whole skin because of the random pattern that you can create the next time and treat the whole skin. This is the most common way uh, today lasers are used, whether it's a CO2 laser, erbium laser or whatnot. Okay, so this is fractionating the laser by breaking it up. So ablative treatment essentially means that you have eliminated the fractionation and you've essentially treated the whole skin without any breaking at all. The entire area is treated without any type of gap between the beams. Non-ablative essentially means the same thing, which is that you're leaving non-treated skin between the columns. So it's called fractionated or non-ablative treatments. But the area that is hit by the skin, of the by the laser to the skin, that gets ablated, but the rest of it is non-ablative, right? In the sense, because it's not treated at all. So you're not ablating or evaporating or blasting it out to Mars or something. So that's a, a very high level. And so you can imagine laser generally can have heat associated with it because lasers do generate heat. They are very precise. 
they are very specific to various things and treat various conditions. So essentially, the, the, the physician that you're working with will have to choose which laser and why that's beneficial to, to a patient. And if you have a CO2 laser, again, the tendency may be just to use that for everything. So if you have one or two or three different types of lasers that can cover the gamut of the problems that you have, it's, it's usually better to do it that way where somebody has some experience using various types of laser for various conditions and not just use one thing for everything. Okay, it's a very high level, you know, very, very, you know, cursory update on this. If you go to radio frequency microneedling now, right? Radio frequency microneedling essentially, again, has a handpiece. You can imagine this as a handpiece. It has basically needles. These are all needles. And these needles, you know, kind of come down to various lengths depending on the technology. Some of them go deeper to eight millimeters almost maybe or whatever. Some of them go two, three, four, so anywhere from two or one all the way to uh, eight millimeters they can go to a, at the present moment. You can imagine this depth can treat much deeper than other areas. Similarly in lasers as well, you can use the energy the way you want to to get deeper in the skin if you wanted to. But again, sticking to the radio frequency microneedling, these are essentially fixed needles that are typically only one use, obviously, because they'll have blood on them because you are poking somebody's skin with an actual instrument versus a beam, which is in air, you know, poking, but this is actually a needle, like any needle that goes into the skin. So these needles, you know, go into the skin and are creating an injury to it. And at the very tip of these needles, I, I kind of marked it in green so I can distinguish it, or along the sheath of it, there's a segment of the, of the needle that has some special technology that can also deliver radio frequency energy to the treated areas. So essentially, not only does it create a hole in the skin, the radio frequency energy tips can deliver the radio frequency energy. What does the radio frequency do? Essentially, it gives heat. It, it generally, generally bulk heats, you know, bulk heat to the entire area of the skin that you're treating. So but it's not very specific, right? It's just delivering heat in the form of radio frequency energy, and it's making some holes as if you're taking a needle multiple times, and there's there could be 20 needle tips, 30 needle tips, 32, whatever, different companies of different numbers, and it has different depths of it. And so again, the physician or the treat, treatment provider would choose uh, how deep to go, how much to turn up the radio frequency energy and all that to treat a person. But this is not very specific, it's very, uh, bulk heating of any type of skin and it is also creating physical holes with a specific needle. So those are broad, broad uh, you know, kind of differences between the two. So for example, let's take these conditions here, pigment. So pigment in this condition, if you use radio frequency to it, it may not get better because it's not specifically treating anything uh, with pigment. It's essentially bulk heating everything. As a matter of fact, if you do it on ethnic skin, it's possible because of that heat from radio frequency, you may create hyperpigmentation because heat can be stimulatory and inflammatory and that can create some degree of uh, uh, hyperpigmentation. So, Pigment treatments are usually not good for radio frequency treatments, right? And if you have a very bloody area, for example, uh, you may not want to treat it because it can bleed some, uh, and, and but radio frequency, sometimes the heat can also coagulate maybe because it's bulk heating, maybe reduce that. Um, sun damage and precancerous sites, radio frequency is not gonna touch at all because essentially it's just creating holes. You can argue that because you're creating the holes and creating an injury, that the healing response of the body can maybe clear it up, it's possible, but generally not the best tool to treat sun damage or precancerous sites. Ethnic skin, again, may not be the best because it could create hyperpigmentation in cases. Uh, you can pre-treat it, you could do things, but you have to be very careful. So, but you know, the radio frequency microneedling is, is good. It's a very good treatment for most type of patients to get skin tightening. It could be good for acne scars or any other type of scars. It could be good for many types of skin and really any age.
And there's also some data that shows that radio frequency can create new blood vessel formation and therefore it could be beneficial and healthy uh, for skin to have that. So you have to choose the right indications for the right person to use uh, the radio frequency microneedling treatment. But it's a very good maintenance treatment. Uh, just like anything else, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to do it very, very frequently. Uh, we typically offer about three treatment sessions over six, eight weeks apart, sometimes depending. And maintenance, maybe once or twice a year, I think is probably a good idea, but depending on the situation again. So radio frequency has its own indications. It's relatively safe for 99% of the people. And um, the needle depth Many companies are coming out with different depths because they want to do aggressive treatments, aggressive meaning deeper treatments with the radio frequency. So the technology is going to keep evolving. As we learn more, it's going to keep getting better. But again, very general treatment, bulk heating, you know, physical needle holes that you're creating in the skin, okay? That's that. Yeah. If you go to the laser side again, pigment is very, very good to treat with lasers because lasers are, like I said, very specific and very precise. So the laser beam can be targeted to a specific color of the pigment and it can vaporize it essentially that's why you have lasers that treat um, uh, tattoos for example or lasers that are good for red marks or brown marks so if you have pigmented skin it's always better to use uh, you know lasers and I'm not going to go into what type of laser for what because it becomes too technical but your physician should be able to help you with that the crepey skin under the eyes they both are fairly good with it I think you can use it for both uh, both uh, technologies sun damage and precancerous sites it's excellent for that with uh, uh, with the lasers versus the radio frequency micro needling. So I would probably choose this. And with ethnic skin, one of the main things you're trying to avoid is hyperpigmentation. That's the tricky part. So there are new lasers that have come out now that are called cold fiber laser. What is a cold fiber laser? Sounds like oxymoron when you say laser generates heat, right? But essentially the coagulation, heat dep deposition or heat deposits from the laser can essentially be tuned out so that you're creating a very precise hole without much heat damage. Therefore minimizing the amount of heat deposits in the skin, hence called a cold fiber laser that can avoid any pigmentation issues for ethnic skin and could be very, very safe. For example, in my practice, I have something called an ultra clear laser, which is called a cold fiber laser precisely for that reason. So it's called a cold fiber laser. And the one I have is called ultra. So I also have a CO2 laser. I've worked with IPL. So I have many types of hair removal laser, but Essentially, to broadly talk about it, for pigmented skin, sun damaged skin, precancerous skin, ethnic skin, lasers are probably best uh, to use. But for general skin tightening, the general treatments for most skin types, I think radio frequency microneedling is probably a very, very good maintenance kind of thing. So you have to be, and sometimes you can combine them right? I mean, they can have advantages too. So you can do one treatment for certain things and you can mix it up so your skin sees different types of energies that could also have various healing effects to the skin. So a very good strategy is to sometimes combine a kind of a treatment algorithm to utilize both of them. But the most important thing, like anything in life, is to be consistent all the time so that you don't expect do one treatment and I'm done, no. You know, skin treatments is almost like exercise. You have to go regularly, you have to keep up with it, you have to use topical agents, you have to you know, make sure that you protect yourself from sun and you have to have a good aesthetician and a good physician that can work together to create great results for you. So that's a broad stroke explanation for most practical purposes, the differences between lasers and radiofrequency microneedling. Hopefully that's helpful.